Welcome back to our channel. Today we're doing part two of our Q&A series, um, answering some questions in English this time. The other day I uploaded a video in Spanish, answering any questions that people had asked in Spanish. Different questions this time, so feel free to watch both if you want. Both have subtitles. Si quieres activar los subtítulos en castellano para este video, lo que tienes que hacer es hacer es activarlos y luego hacer clic en el icono del engranaje y elegir el idioma. Eso es algo que puedes hacer en todos nuestros vídeos. Siempre recibimos muchos comentarios sobre no hay subtítulos o cómo activarlos. Eso es como se hace. Todos los, los vídeos los tienen y nada. The video in Valenciano will come out next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We're not ready yet for that. <laughs> no. <laughs> First question. What prompted the change or was it always a long-term goal? The change of coming to live here and maybe live in Spain as well, I guess. We did talk about this on the previous video. I think a big a big one was... I don't think... It wasn't always... For me, it wasn't always a, a, for me, for a me, goal. For me, it was. Yeah, yeah. I'm like exactly where I always dreamed of being my entire life. So yeah, it was. Yeah, but, but I think for both of us, like as a couple, it was when we did the Camino de Santiago. Yeah. So we did a, a, a Camino de Santiago is a very famous pilgrimage in, in Spain. That the, the most the most important the most famous one starts in France and ends in Galicia. And when we did that, we sort of fell in love with the Spanish countryside and, and it sort of gave us the the inspiration that that it's something that we could actually mm. do. It, it, yeah. It, it, we saw think... we saw people living like quite simple lives. Yeah. And we met so many people. Like we saw people living in really simple little farmhouses um, in little towns. Um, or little do, like rural businesses. Yeah, tiny rural businesses. Like so many people that we met on the route who were doing interesting stuff in their lives. You know, like people come on that route as sometimes when they're at like a cross point in their lives and it gave us a lot of inspiration yeah. that we could actually do something like that as well so so yeah yeah then it was just a case of making it happen <laughs> going home yeah. selling things putting the house on the market and yeah Moving trying to, to make it, trying to make it work yeah and then the pandemic happened and yeah we ended up moving in the middle of the pandemic but we made it question about what jobs we have um what professional qualifications we have well, <laughs> none related to this, that's for sure. <laughs> Mauro is an engineer yeah. by, prof by profession. Well, we both haven't answered this very well. <laughs> yeah, shall I say mine and you say yours? Yeah. <laughs> what professions did we have? Yeah, so, so we both work in software engineering, but uh, I studied mechanical engineering. Yeah, and I studied English literature. Yeah, yeah, we so, both have BAs. I have a master in English literature as well for some reason. Um, yeah, now we're here. I would say that mechanical engineering is a bit helpful, but the fact that <laughs> I haven't worked as a mechanical engineer a lot, it, I've sort of forgotten a lot of things. I'm sort of out, out of practice. But in terms of yeah, with, frame of mind and like being able to, one of us to be able to measure things, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> It's helpful. Yeah, I can write a nice poem about <laughs> <laughs> it when it's built. <laughs> Behold the chicken coop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been software engineers for the last six years. Mauro is still working in that. I stopped doing that about two months ago. Um, a question about whether this would be like a good place to have children, whether children would be too lonely out here, schools, um, proximity to schools is something that we get asked a lot. Um, Honestly, like we're close to the local, the nearest school. It's in the nearest town, which is just a couple of kilometers away. We have friends who live in similar places, setups to this, um, off grid, you know, um, in the countryside, not in the town. And they send their kids to the local school. From what I hear, it's a lovely school. We're not super remote, like we said in yeah. the other video. Like we're only a couple of kilometers from the nearest town. The nearest city is like 40 minutes by car. There's towns of varying different sizes around here. There are primary schools and secondary schools. I don't see any issue with yeah. having kids here. And like from the kids we know around here, it's like 
it's an awesome place to be. Yeah. There's like, so many different <laughs> things to explore. Um, they all like, have like a million forts yeah, and tree houses. Learn how to build things <laughs> and like be um, inventive and creative and like be in contact with plants and animals. It's like I, I would have loved it yeah. as a kid here. So yeah, yeah. bring your kids. That's yeah. the answer to that. Do we have a compost heap? Yes, we do. We More have several. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to figure out the best place and the best way of doing our composting. You'd think it would be simple. It is simple. You just put stuff in a pile and it rots. But um, it's like, I don't know why I'm making this so complicated. Like where to put it, how many like bays to have, how to make it easier to turn how to more easily get the stuff out of the compost toilet and take it to the compost heat without having to walk all across the fields. Um, but yeah, we have a few. So this is our current humanure pile, our compost pile where we empty out the compost toilet. We're just in front of the house here, so it's in quite a convenient location. We normally have it covered with this black plastic, not for smell or anything like that, because it doesn't smell at all, but just to keep the moisture in when it's warm. But it's been raining lately, so we've been leaving the plastic off. On the other side here are the remains of the um, humanure compost pile from last year. We only had it composting a year. I guess it got up to temperature and composted all right, because it's broken right down into um, some lovely compost. This is just the remains which is like quite twiggy. Um, it was from the bottom layer where I had a lot of sticks and twigs and stuff at the bottom which I was composting. The rest has all been used as you can see. It's gone. Actually at the end that pile once it composted down didn't make a huge amount like it really shrank in size. Um, it was really nothing. And then dotted around in other terraces we have other compost bays like this. We just chuck anything on here when we're working in any other kind of part of the land. This is a mix of mostly like grass cuttings and some of the manure which was delivered recently. The pile on this side is covered and is on its way to composting down. Yeah I think the key, the key is to like figure out how to like where to put them relatively to the processes that you do yeah. in your farm that produce the material for it. So. So, yeah. for example, if you have um, chickens and animals, you will have a compost heap close to them because you will regularly put stuff there. Or if, but, but for example, for things that are more seasonal that you do maybe once a year, like, I don't know, pruning your olive trees, then it doesn't really matter because yeah. it, it sort of needs to be close-ish to, to that. And the one close to the toilet is also an important one. Um, yeah. And then at the moment, we're not really worrying about generating compost really quickly and we know a lot of people do like oh do compost in 21 days mm. if you turn it and do this proportion and like um, wet it every couple of days it's like we know that those things are a possibility but we're not in the need yet we to like produce compost that, yeah. that quickly but it's something interesting that we would like to try are we vegetarian uh yeah pretty much yes well, no I, I would <laughs> i would say no i would say no because yeah. because like, this is a complicated question. This is like a, a question that has a very long answer and we don't have time to talk about <laughs> this. We, we, well, we take this, this stuff seriously because it, it is part of our, our way of thinking and our, our way of understanding the world. I think vegetarian is just a diet. It's like a diet that you choose to eat. Yeah, that's and a then I think about we're that. I think we're closer we're closer to veganism in the sense that um, it's not just a diet, it's a way of it's like, like it's an ethical yeah it's an position. ethical choice but um we do eat some product animals but essentially we really think about like the environmental impact of our food choices and not not only food like products that we that we use so we we just care about the environment and the and, animals and the animals too but 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 it, but it's like the animals and the environment are just like factors of the equation. So we think that, for example, if we know friends that have chickens and we know how they treat them, we're okay with eating those eggs. Or if we have friends that we know how they treat their goats, we're happy to eat their cheese. That's the sort yeah. of Or if uh, we have our criteria. own chickens or our yeah. own goats or whatever. Um, if we know the processes and the way that the animals have been reared and looked after and cared for, and yeah, how it's done. For me, I've, I was vegan for like, I don't know, nearly a decade now and um, I'm just starting to like eat eggs and stuff again and cheese when I know where it's from. But for me, that position was always like based on the industry, not wanting to contribute to the industry. If that like industrial process of 
food production is taken out of the equation and you're looking at more like local food production, then that logic that I used to <laughs> arrive at the fact that veganism was the right thing for me doesn't apply anymore. So that's where we are. We are at the moment. Um, yeah. Can't really think, say more than that, I guess. Yeah, and we are aware that there's bound to be contradictions like in our way of thinking probably now and in the future and we'll have to think about it but but it's not yeah it's not yeah. a it's not a black or white either you eat animals or not because the setting here like in a city it's really easy to be vegan but but here where you have to like essentially produce the food that you need to survive mm. like you need to think about it a bit more so we're aware that it's complicated and there's bound to be contradictions and, and our we, thinking is changing all the time yeah. as well we've only been here for like a year and yeah. we're starting to think about these things in a different way yep. okay a popular question here about costs um, how much the land cost how much um, someone might expect to pay for something similar in a similar area um, taxes etc I think that's various different questions in there um, we I think the the big disclaimer here is that don't ask us for either financial advice or legal <laughs> advice. Like we don't know about that stuff, and we think you should pay for a professional uh, <laughs> to to know about that stuff or oh, yeah, research it, research it on your own. So so don't take any of this as advice because yeah. But this yeah. question is more just uh, yeah okay the tax part yeah I don't know about that <coughs> but the cost. Like we paid, um, we talked about this briefly in the Spanish version. We'll go into a little more detail here because I think more people ask this in English. Um, we paid 33,000 for this. Euro. Euros for this property, which was actually three properties. So there was the ruin, which came with just over a hectare of land. That was about 16,000, yeah. I think. Then there was the small stone Masia where we live, which came with a small parcel of land, like 3,000 3, yeah, square meters, something like, 3, 000, something like that. Yeah. yeah, And that was about 14,500, something like that. And then there was a tiny like patch of land which had been sold off to someone else, which was like, we had to buy it because it just made up the whole, otherwise it would have been really weird. And that was another 800 square meters, which we paid 2,000 euros for. So yeah, in total, I think it was like 33. Um, there were a few extra thousand for taxes. I think we paid like a percentage of the price, like 3% or something, or something so the, like that as like a tax, the, yeah. um, like a purchasing tax. And the real, real estate fees. The real fees. estate fee, the, uh, like a lawyer's fee. So I think we said all in all it came up to probably like 38,000. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, that's what we paid. As for what we like might expect to pay for something similar in this area, I mean... Oh, it's hard because yeah. it really varies. It varies on like the kind of land, like Sicano land, which is dry land, like non-irrigated, often quite rocky, usually just with like olive, almond, carob trees. It's often valued like much cheaper per square metre. If you've got a bit of land like this land where we're sitting now, which is like irrigated and it's flat and it's for like cultivating vegetables, valued a bit higher. Depends on the state of the house. Um, I mean, we've got a ruin, which I don't know how much that... I don't know. Like yeah, I don't know if it was valued worth. I don't properly. know if it was valued right. The stone house to me seems like so much more valuable because we can actually live in it. Yeah, they were the same kind of price. Yeah. I don't know. I, th I think it's a weird market because there's not a lot of people in, uh, like at least from our experience in this area, there's not a lot of people wanting to do what we're trying to do. Spanish, of, Spanish of, people. Spanish people, yeah. yeah. Of, of wanting to buy a house in the countryside and live there because most people tend to live in towns and then have like a little plot of land uh, in the outskirts. So it's weird because the real estate agents didn't seem to value the same things that we were valuing. Like they mm. completely discounted the houses because they would think that we would knock them down and build from scratch. So they were essentially counting them as zero and they were only sort of selling us square meters of land. Yeah. While for us, it was the opposite. It's like, well, if that stone house is in good shape that's really valuable for us yeah. while that massive ruin is nothing so and it'll cost more probably to knock it down and yeah <laughs> yeah start from scratch and then and then if you extend that to the rest of the country we have no clue because like yeah. the, it depends on the area it depends on um like how close to a bigger city you are maybe it's an area where a lot of mm. people with money buy uh, yeah. houses maybe it's an area good for wine and then it's more expensive it just really 
depends. It's a, yeah, it's harder to answer that part of the question. But a good place to start is to look on Idealista. I'll put a link in the description. It's a Spanish property site like Rightmove or Zoopla or something that just collects lots of adverts from different places. Search in different areas, put in like terrenos um, or like fincas rústicas and see what the prices are coming up. That's, that'll give you a good idea. Yeah. A little part of that question was about like property taxes and um, whether we know any like non-EU residents or non-EU citizens who've done something like this. Well, the property tax, I said that when we paid for it, there was like a 3 or 4% tax that you pay on purchase. Um, and we have a tax that we have to pay every year. I think it's like yeah. 50 euros or something. Yeah, it's like council, it's like tax for, for like your local services, like for the bin yeah. collection and I don't know what else. So it's, not it's, like, very, it's not very it's much, it's like 50 nothing. euros. I don't know if that's because of the type of land this is or what. I don't know if people in town well, pay more. We don't get a lot of services. Like, there's it's a like, bin at the end there's of the road. Bin, there's a single <laughs> bin at the end of the road and it gets collected. So if you only take that into account, it's quite expensive. <laughs> But, uh, but, but yeah. <laughs> oh, and do we know any non-EU residents who've done this? Well, me, but I was married to a Spanish citizen. So yeah. I don't know anyone who's done it since Brexit, though. Yeah. Apart from me. Yeah, it's definitely become harder for British people to do it. Um, yeah. Well, this question mentions Australians, but I guess it's the same. I think yeah. the easiest way to do it is with a non-lucrative visa, which you then convert into a non-lucrative residence when you get here. It means you can't work in... Spain or the EU, you have to have your own financial means of existence. Um, but yeah, talk to a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> we have a good one. Yeah, if don't, you, don't <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we don't know a lot about this stuff. I'll take my lawyer hat off now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't have put it in the first place. No, I think that's. I no, think, no, it's 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 good advice, correct. but but like don't like re do your own research. Yeah. <laughs> the question about the solar generator that we've been using recently. How's it doing? The solar generator? You mean the the, the panels and the battery? Ah, yeah. I thought you meant the gasoline generator. No, I think I think this is about the solar one. Well, the solar one is doing great. We use it all the time. It's charging right now. It powers the TP mostly when we've got visitors in there. Shall we answer just in case for the other generator? <laughs> How's it doing? <laughs> the other doing generator. great. Makes a lot of noise. Smells horrible. Really hate it, but it does the job. Barely use it. Yeah. Now that now that it's sunny, we it's just not going to be used at all because the batteries are full all day. Yeah. But it's good. It's good to know that it's there for an emergency. Yeah. But we hate it. <laughs> Another great question. What was our checklist for a plot of land when we were looking? And is there anything we'd add or remove from the list? Yeah, so water was a big one this, for This us. was on our checklist. Yeah, yeah. yeah so so there's, the, there's the ones that we, what we know now we would change and the ones we, that we definitely had. So we definitely wanted water and um, just land to cultivate. Yeah, um, for vegetables. Yeah, not, for vegetables. just olives and almonds. Yeah, because that's the main thing you find in this area. It's just secano land, which is dry land, just red uh, soil, very characteristic, and just olives and almonds. Which is great, but we wanted great. to do a bit more as well. Yeah, so we wanted just greenery and uh, good access to water. That was our main. And well, we were also looking within a certain radius, like we were looking, we wanted to be able to travel from Valencia because we have family and friends there. And that was like where we landed in Spain when we first came. So we didn't want to go like to the middle of nowhere. We wanted to at least have some connection yeah. to like friends and family. And price, I guess, was also we wanted to be able to pay for it in cash and not borrow any money. Yeah. We might not have even been able to borrow money for something like this. Um, so we wanted to not have that kind of debt. So yeah, money was a limiting factor and so and we did want to be able to live there yeah yeah that's, yeah, that's the main thing initially we considered having uh, buying a plot of land in the outskirts of a city and just sort of commute to yeah. it yeah because it's very common to see plots of land that are just adjacent to towns and people live in the town and work on the on the plot of land yeah. so we wanted to live here yeah, but we did consider, we were, at the beginning we did actually consider that and yeah. I think that's a really good option as well, like depending on what you want to do. So what about things that we would add to the list or remove knowing what we know now? So I think one would be to, whatever your radius is, just extend it a bit more mm. because because you can always, like you might miss on some really good deals that you might make, may be able to, um, to, make, them to work. make them work. We would have also maybe, I mean... We're adding these things onto the list, but like nowhere you you find is gonna like tick all of the criteria. So I mean, in a perfect world, yes, we'd add more things to the list and consider them. But you always have to compromise somewhere. Yeah. 
Um, another thing to think about maybe would be access, like we didn't really think about that at all. Um, the road up here is really bad, the path in is really narrow, um, the space to park and turn and have deliveries is tiny, so that's an issue. Um, Especially if you're planning on building a house, like a traditional construction that you will need a cement truck mm -hmm. and maybe a crane and stuff like that. Um, because for, for agricultural resources like manure and stuff like that, people tend to be quite um yeah they have like, like a small loose. truck usually and they're like oh yeah. yeah i can get in there yeah i've been up worse roads yeah so <laughs> so so that's easier but but for a for like a proper construction site they will have regulations that will say like if the road is yeah. not 2.5 meters we won't go and stuff like yeah. that so um that's something to think about yeah we didn't think about it at all but yeah. it would have it could have been on the checklist and it could have been something we thought about Ah, another one that we didn't think about, but like I think we got really lucky with, was closeness to town services, things that you might need. We are like two kilometers from the nearest town, and like within ten minutes drive, we can get all the stuff we need. Like there's builders, merchants, there's agricultural co-ops, there's yeah. stuff that sells everything that we could possibly need, and there's people with farms and things that have you know straw, manure, etc. Um, really close by, and if you want to. If you want to sell as well, you want to think about like where's your market going to be, like where are you going to sell your stuff, or are you going to want tourists to come? Are you in an area where tourists are going to be? Are you one hour up a mountain where no one's going to bother to come and visit you? Yeah. Like stuff like that could play a part. We didn't think about that really, no, no, but we not got that lucky. Much. I think we're in a good like position. Yeah, I think not like massively that. touristy, but but uh, but in terms for for we just know what we want to do, but like for agriculture. Um, we're in a great spot because we have yeah, yeah. access to a lot of resources f from local people. Like we yeah. don't have to go to big shops or anything like that. Just a guy that does firewood and a guy yeah. that does manure, and you just give them eighty euros <laughs> and they come with a truck. That that kind of thing is yeah. I uh, guess really I good. guess like most of Spain, rural Spain is like that. I don't I don't know. But, yeah, we don't um, know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's something that you can just assume is going to be the case. But yeah, I don't know. I guess one other tiny little thing is like one property that we looked at really early on. Well, we didn't look at it. We were going to look at it, but we learned it was then on a north facing slope. So I don't know, just little things like that. That would have been bad for growing stuff and for capturing like solar energy. And yeah, that wouldn't have been good. So yeah, unless you're in like that. the southern hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, that's <Yeah>. true. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like think about, think about the sun and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, sorry to everyone in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. That was too northern hemisphere centric. Yeah, let's be more inclusive <laughs> oh, to other I'm hemispheres. Sorry, I'm sorry. How do we filter our water for drinking? Yeah, we don't. No. Easy. Um, it comes from a spring, from a municipal spring. Um, we just drink directly from it like everyone else in the town. Um, nobody we don't, has died yet. Yeah, nobody has died. No, it's um, a, it is a municipal water. Yeah, source. yeah. It's not treated, but it is like tested and maintained by the town. You're supposed to come here and get water. That's what it's for. Um, yeah. And we don't drink directly from the deposits that you see on the videos. We take it from the source of the spring and just carry it with bottles. And we only use this water for washing and, and irrigation. Yep. It's tough for enjoying being around the cats. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I think he thinks he is a cat. He, he really likes chasing and being chased. And we struggle to find dogs his size because b most yeah. dogs are bigger than him. And then when he gets uh, chased and eventually caught, <laughs> then they kind of trample over him and like sometimes hurt him. What so so with the cats it's good because they're his size and the cats don't really like run over him or, or yeah. try to bite him. They just kind of like try swipe to him. <laughs> swipe him and get him to go away. So I think it's a good relationship. Uh, yeah, he's a good having the time of his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's loving he's it. He's super happy and he's like, he's very good at coming and telling them off when, when you tell the cats off, when they jump on something they shouldn't or they, I don't know, get into their food and you go, no. He comes yeah. running, like yeah, he's like the cat very police, far away. like he will be there in an instant. Yeah. It's the best way to call him in from the fields, you know, yeah. like you can call his name, but he might, you know, come when he feels like it. But if you start telling off a cat, he'll, he'll be come. there immediately. Yeah. Be there. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which YouTubers do we like to watch? I, I watch a lot of NBA basketball highlights. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Drafteados is the best channel, uh, but... Um, That's probably illegal. No, 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 that one's not illegal. So the highlights are illegal, but, but Drafteos is just like news and analysis, which is good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but more related to what we do, I think the one that inspired me the most to, and sort of made me aware that I could do this and actually like doing this 
um, was uh, an uh, Justin Rhodes, right? Yeah, Justin Rhodes, uh, a guy in uh, the United States that he just did. He did, he did longer videos, but he also did these vlogs where he just does the day-to-day -day chores that he just goes and feeds the chickens and um, and does a lot of like day-to-day -day problem solving of well, this um, I don't know the the water uh, line for the chickens broke. How can I fix it? And all, all those kind of things were really interesting to actually see how they're done in a realistic uh, context. And I guess the other one, my other favorite is uh, Kirsten Dixon, who she she does documentaries on like interesting uh, alternative lifestyles mm. and uh, alternative ways of building houses or like or um, eco villages. Yeah, we watch a lot of the probably a lot of the standard stuff that probably a lot of you watch as well like the market gardeners the famous you know market gardeners no diggers like charles dowding richard perkins um those kinds of channels yeah. um i try and watch a lot of like spanish gardening and like huerta channels as well like el sembrador la huerta de Iván, fuera de campo objetivo de luz, objetivo de luz i'll put all of these actually we have a page on our website um which hopefully i will have made live by <laughs> the time we release this video which has a page of resources on it so i'll put all of those on there if you want to follow up any of these but yeah a lot of the like standard stuff that you've probably heard of probably all the ones well. all the ones in the related videos that you see now yeah. <laughs> we watch those yeah youtube <laughs> does the hard work of figuring yeah. out what we should watch for us so <laughs> how is climate change affecting our farm Ooh, that's a big one yeah so this is something that we it's it's a big part of like the environment in general is just a big a big part of why we do things and how we do things and um Obviously, we haven't been here long enough to see the effects firsthand, mm. but from what we gathered from neighbors and people that lived here all their lives, we learned that it's the things that we already knew, which is that um, more extreme climate events happen more often, like bigger it storms, it rains, more it rains, it rains harder and for longer, um, uh, things flood, um, longer, droughts. longer drought periods and uh, more often uh, more frequent forest fires so those yeah. are the main things that um, like that people comment on yeah people comment on but also the scientists are also yeah. saying that those things expect. are happening <laughs> it's what you expect yeah. that would happen if you read about these things so so um so so yeah but all of these things are really interesting to us and they're a big part of um this project so so we are always trying to understand them and read and and just Try see how to we can work with them and yeah do the best we can i guess in this little area yeah. with those factors yeah. that was the last question last question yeah it's been really fun to answer them made us think about some things and yeah we had a lot of fun doing these two versions in spanish and english well what are we gonna do now then just say goodbye <laughs> <laughs> no we're gonna we're gonna go learn how to drive i'm learning how to drive so um, learning how to drive. we're gonna it's practice terrifying. and try not to try not to crash <laughs> thank you for watching um thank you for all your questions and we'll see you in the next one hello toffee you're so wet He's so where wet. have you been <laughs> have you been for a swim it's so wet why are you so wet toffee where have you been <laughs>